with, uh, with that background, let me bring Lynn Brown, who is Vice President, to the program, to the podium, rather, who is in charge of program, which you will introduce uh, Paul Squela. Hi, good afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Paula Escueva, who uh, is the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor of Engineering at Penn State Berks. He is a native of Venezuela, and over his career, has served as Dean of the Institute for Advanced Studies and Administration in Caracas, and President of the Engineering Research Institute also in Caracas. From 2003 to 2008, he served as a consultant for the European Union as a part of the review of the European Union Latin American Scholarship Program, where he served as an expert panel on an expert panel that met annually in Brussels to audit the program and advise the European Union on development opportunities. He's a great friend of the World Affairs Council and has been a board member and served as well, and we welcome him today to speak. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lee, and, and I want to thank uh, David Carl and Lee Brown for the uh, kind invitation to be here with you today. They uh, they contacted me back in uh, I think it was June to uh, to see how I saw events in Venezuela and if I saw any changes. And I said, Oh, I just don't see any changes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I. We'll go over this uh, in the talk. I also want to uh, thank the uh, World Affairs Council. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to be a member of the board. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's really interesting because uh, when I was a grad student at Penn State, uh, this, this was years ago, uh, around 74, 78, I, I wrote a piece for the Collegian uh, kind of criticizing the, the U.S. Uh, community for not being aware of our world problems. Well, I'm, I'm proud to say today that I changed my views uh, due to the uh, World Affairs Council. I mean, the, the way uh, the World Affairs Council's approach that vision of the world uh, with uh, speakers and feeding information and bringing a, a very, very neutral and open-minded dialogue about the world is, is really amazing. and. Uh, I think you guys in Reading have a jewel in the, in the World Affairs Council, so I, I want to recognize uh, that. Uh, so let's let's uh, let's go to my talk and uh, and uh, the reason why I was trying to be nice by by saying that uh, I've derailed democracy, but the situation is really uh, complicated and, and perhaps a real challenge for most uh, Democrats in the world. Uh, that have pointed these out. So, uh, you know, I wanted to show that there's, a, there's this huge deviation from democracy, and it, it looks like a, 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 a huge task to bring Venezuela back to, to the race. So, I just want to show this is a, one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures of, uh, of Caracas. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but you I think I put a, a presentation on each table uh, so that you can look at it. But this shows you the drama uh, in one picture. This is, this is a highway in Caracas, an elevated highway that has uh, uh, shacks built in the, below the highway. So you have a modern highway, uh, and then you have this uh, in uh, below the poverty. And these are I think in a, in a, to a certain extent, these are the two worlds that are fighting, or the two sides that are fighting in Venezuela. Because the, uh, what has happened is that the Chavistas, has, they cultivated the vote of these people to... Uh, but, you know, the, then you ask the question, who would allow uh, this type of uh, construction below the highway? I mean, it's, Certainly difficult to get onto the highway to provide maintenance to the highway, uh, and, and you could say anything, but really it is populism because you allow that in order to gain votes, and, and that's perhaps not not proper. But then the government had the project of uh, widening the highway up on top, uh, and then they decided to build the highway to build a parallel or widening the uh, never lanes 
and they built this uh, highway on a creek here that, as probably as some of you know, uh, in tropical countries when it rains, it pours, and then most of these type of creeks, they, they flood the, the area. So, so you know, it, as soon as they began to build this, the, uh, it, it happened, it flooded, and, and then it flooded the highway in the back uh, of the picture. So it, the water level reached uh, a, 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 a very dangerous uh, level. Then, so then you ask yourself, well, why did that happen? Why did uh, the government uh, allow this construction in that place? This was against the opinion of the Institute of Civil Engineers in Venezuela. It was against the opinion of environmentalists. It was kind of imposed. There was no discussion, no town hall meeting, nothing. Uh, uh, and I'm just pointing that out because that's the way business is conducted by the government in Venezuela right now. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really a, a challenge. So um, I, I thought I would show that picture to give you a brief summary of what we're going to discuss. Uh, so I'm going to talk, my, this is a summary of my talk. I'm going to go a little bit over, very briefly, the Venezuela's economy. I'm going to go over the political landscape, maybe try to explain how, how we got here, and then what are going to be the potential outcomes uh, of the, uh, in terms of government and, and, and the economy and the politics. Uh, this is kind of a busy slide, but just wanted to show the green bars show the revenue of oil by year from 1980 to 2016. And uh, it, it's this column here multiplied by 2,000 billions. It seems sad to me, but I think it is right. Uh, so, you know, the, the income, the Venezuelan income due to oil is huge. Or it was huge. And then the prices of oil declined, and we got to the bottom here. Uh, and I'll show you later that in addition to the... Uh, to the decrease in the price of oil, there is a decrease in the oil production of Venezuela. So it's kind of a double whammy uh, uh, that is really impacting the population and the economy. Uh, and then the uh, the continuous line here is uh, is inflation, which is on this side, and this uh, slide that that covered on, up until 2016 fell short of, of what we're beginning to see. Right now, inflation is really, really high. So you can see that uh, you can manage a country. This is this is when when Chavez came into power in 1999, and this is his period of uh, of uh, as president. And you can see that that you can really control inflation when you have a lot of money. Uh, you can really, you know, you cannot see the the problems. Uh, when you have that huge revenue, and then as soon as the prices began to come down, that's when we enter a real, a real crisis, uh, which is impacting <coughs> the population. So let's just look at uh, one of the problems of what I believe is the lack of transparency of the government. The Venezuelan Central Bank has not published the main economic indicators, such as inflation, GDP, GDP growth, GDP per capita, and unemployment since 2015. Actually, I went to the website, and it is the, the, the central bank website, and it is worse than that. Inflation is only reported up until 2015 at 108.8%, which is high. And it was the highest in the world at that point. Uh, unemployment uh, in the last they reported 2009, 7.2%. GDP, they, they report this figure in, in, in Bolivars, which is meaningless because uh, what's happening to the currency right now is that it has been profoundly devalued. Uh, and then the GDP growth, the last data from 2003. So what are people doing? How, how, would, you, how would an investor or any local would guide uh, decisions about investment or about uh, setting new projects or, or about uh, 
um, new initiatives. What would you find information? So, you know, there are sources like The Economist, which, which uh, would give you a snapshot of uh, Venezuela in terms of the, the price of oil, the budget balance, and the GDP, the change by year. Uh, and they, by the way, they call it a Rocky Horror Show. Uh, so, uh, but, but you see, whether you can argue whether these figures are right or wrong, uh, the reality is that this is what, what people are using. So I'm going to walk you. So this is where, where we are right now, where we are in trouble. We have a, a, a GDP uh, decrease, uh, uh, consistent decrease of GDP, really uh, uh, significant. So, you know, beginning with the real GDP growth, again, all my sources are, uh, you know, are there. I'm not making things up, and, and I have, uh, I've tried to the best of my knowledge to use, you know, particularly the International Monetary Fund uh, data. So this is from the IMF data mapper, uh, and this is Venezuela in red, and then in, 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 in uh, gray is the advanced economies, this line here, and then the emerging economies in, in yellow, and you can see they're all doing reasonably well, reasonable growth. And then you can see the world, which is the, the blue line, it's kind of an average, but you can see Venezuela really in a huge downfall. And what people are predicting is that if, true, the government has control of a lot of things, but the economy might be the, uh, the uh, that would bring the government down. It, it, it can be a, can be a, a can, it can define things, but this is what, what we have. You know, essentially, almost uh, four years of decrease in GDP growth, which is, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, do you, do you remember a year in the U.S. where you had uh, uh, GDP growth below zero? Uh, uh, and you rarely find this. What is, what is difficult about this is that I don't think the government, in this notion that if they don't see the numbers, they, they're, they're, if they'll go, it, it'll go away, or, or, or they're not, they don't know the economy, or... Uh, but, you know, it's fair to say that Cuba has similar, has a, a very similar situation over the, uh, over the years. So, uh, it is, uh, so that's as far as uh, GDP growth. So let's look at, at inflation. Uh, this is, this is, I took it from Bloomsburg, which in turn took it from the International Monetary Fund. And, and this is a projection in 2018, but the, uh, the prediction is that inflation is gonna go, is gonna grow to be uh, 2,500% next year. And, uh, uh, and that's not, and, and this year the prediction is that it will close at, at about a little over a thousand percent a year. So you can see how you know inflation is killing, particularly those people who are on a wage payroll type of thing or uh, uh, per hour wage. Uh, it's just amazing. It's devastating uh, what what's going on. So you know a lot of people have talked about a humanitarian crisis. Added to this, the purchasing power of the government, because they don't have any money, has gone down, and so they, they want to control the supply of everything, but they don't have the, the, the means to supply. So you get this uh, shortage of medication, food, and, and, and just about everything. Uh, and and uh, I have to tell you, confess here, that my wife prepares a box every month with a few things, you know, black beans, uh, uh, corn flour, which they cannot find in Venezuela for her mother, which which ends up costing us uh, a lot more than. But but that's the way uh, uh, people are, are contributing to it. So here's the ranking of uh, inflation, uh, and you can see by far the next uh, country down in the world with inflation of 25%. Argentina shows up here. They 
you know, they, they had a, an inflation problem. Um, there was a, there's a new government. Uh, they didn't, uh, you know, open up the economy. And so things, the, 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 the table is set in Argentina to, for growth and also for control of, uh, of inflation. But, but that's a ranking where you don't want to be. Uh, and then this is another problem. This is oil production in millions of barrels a day in Venezuela. So Venezuela was at 2.3 million barrels a day in 2015. And then in 2016, it went down to uh, 2 million 154. Uh, and then uh, and, and I took the data exactly as it shows on the, on the website of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, uh, and uh, so they, 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 after the end of 2016, they go by quarter, and then after the third quarter of 2017, they go by month. So the decrease in, in oil production in Venezuela has gone down 20% from, from 2015. That's huge, and what it is showing, it, it's something that I don't think people saw, but when Chavez came into power in 2002. There was a there was a strike in the oil industry. Of the uh, most of the management in, in the oil industry reject the appointment of a president based on political background, which is what Chavez wanted to do. And so there was a national strike, a strike of the oil industry, and Chavez decided to fire 20,000 executives. This is back in 2002. Now is when you see. You know, when you lose that huge amount of human capital, how, how you see uh, the impact in the industry. Uh, so they, they've not been able to recover. The, uh, the unofficial information, again, is that these numbers are re self-reported by Venezuela, and they're not true either. <laughs> the, the number is lower than this. And I don't know if you follow the, uh, uh, the news, but uh, the president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, just fired the, uh, the president of PDVSA, the oil industry, and appointed a general from the National Guard in that position. Uh, the guy has been detained, the previous president has been detained, and the president of PDVSA previous to this last one, who was the UN ambassador in the, uh, from Venezuela, the Venezuela US amb uh, the Venezuela ambassador to the UN, was uh, is also being indicted for fraud, and, and the accusation is that they they've been uh, you know dealing willy with the oil, uh, selling it open in the open seas, uh, and transferring oil to other places, uh, and and they were you know taking money from that. So uh, this is a kind of a very shady uh, situation, but the end result is that. Uh, the revenue, the old revenue, the so-called revenue, is not coming to Venezuela. And then the question that people ask is how is it that the country with the largest reserves of oil in the world is having this problem? And only because the government is stuck in this socialist, uh, you know, 21st century socialism, uh, which is, uh, nobody knows what it is, I don't know what it is, I've tried to read the documents of the political party, and they don't explain it clearly. They, they, it's, all, it's all full of ideas, ideals, not not uh, concrete uh, a, a concrete roadmap to economic growth. Just a fake uh, promise. Uh, anyways, uh, so this is uh, uh, for the sake of, of reporting uh, true information. Uh, according to uh, to an author who published a book called The Venezuelan Diaspora, uh, about 2.2 million Venezuelans have fled the country since 1999. But the number can be high. Uh, there is, uh, and, and again, this is news, and, and you know, I don't have means to corroborate it, but uh, Brazil has set up 10 cities in the border to receive Venezuelans, refugees, and Colombia has set up shelters to receive Venezuelan refugees that are coming, you know, across the border, getting out of Venezuela because of this situation. 
you know, you would understand why, because the minimum wage is about, uh, you know, which is about, I, I think right now it's about 200,000 <coughs> believers, and that's about uh, the current, the black market exchange rate or the parallel market exchange rate is about $2. So they're making $2 a month. And then you, then you go on across to Colombia, and immediately you get $200 a month. And it's the same thing if you cross the border to Brazil. So it, it's like you're a millionaire if you go across the border. Uh, anyways, I decided to look at it from a more reliable source, and I took the, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the data from July 14, 2017, and I just looked at the uh, number of Venezuelans that have asked for asylum as refugees. So, in the case of Venezuela, from 2016 to 2017, the number has doubled from 27,000 to 50,000. Uh, countries of destination, <coughs> favorite uh, place, the U.S., yeah, it's very nice. I, I did the same thing 15, 20 years ago, so. <laughs> Uh, Brazil, uh, Peru, Spain, Mexico. Now, I, I need to remind you that uh, Venezuela, in its good days, was the country of destination for refugees. When, when Europe had a bad time, when Chile had Pinochet, Venezuela received a lot of uh, uh, Chileans. Uh, when Peru had problems, they came to Venezuela. When Argentina had trouble, they came to Venezuela. And back in the 50s, there was a huge wave of immigration from Italy, uh, Spain, and Portugal. Uh, you know, language is, uh, is perhaps what helps. But, uh, but all these people are now who their children have uh, the possibility of uh, European citizenship are going back. Uh, so that's why you see a, an outflow of, of people. But the point is that uh, this is happening. <clears throat> you know, the, the, so, and if you ask uh, the, the government, and, and if you ask those who are fanatics of the, of the uh, socialism of the 21st century, they'll say, well, that's a good thing, because uh, then they, they won't have any more votes. The opposition will lose votes. So that's a rationale how they look at it. They don't look at it as uh, the loss of human capital. So it, it's uh, very sad, but it is happening. Um, so now I get to the core of my talk. I was just warming up. <laughs> so what do we? What do I mean by derailment? Uh, uh, and and I, I wonder. You know, sometimes. When you, when you have people like Chavez, Hugo Chavez, who perhaps had a good uh, idea of what he wanted to do in the long term, but his project was about control and about how to remain in power. So I'm going to give you an idea of how that happened. So Chavez was elected in 1999. I, I, uh, I didn't put that time in there because... Uh, and he was elected by an overwhelming majority. I think he got over 60% of the vote. In a, in, in a very clean election, because the, at that point the, the opposition was in control of government. And, and, and Chavez has so overwhelming support from all sectors, including uh, the private sector of the economy, uh, industry people, who are now sorry that they, they did that, that they supported Chavez. Um, so he got elected in 1999. He knew he was popular. He knew he could make changes. So what he did is he, he uh, called for uh, uh, the uh, um, call for an election of a national assembly, constitutional assembly, to uh, uh, make over the constitution, to write a new constitution. And what he did is he two things that, that in, in my opinion, go on the line of derailment. He extended the period of uh, the president for, for, from four years to six years. And then immediately after the reform was approved, he went into elections. And he knew he was going to win. So, and, and in addition to that, his uh, election in 1999 coincided with uh, an increase in the price of oil. So he had the money to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do that. So 
the net result of that is that he extended his uh, presidential period from four years, which was the original mandate, to seven years. And that's where, where I think our troubles begin to a certain extent, because <coughs> that's where you begin to derail from, from the rule of uh, democracy. Uh, so we had elections in 2016, then we had elections in 2012, Chavez got elected, he knew he was sick, he knew he couldn't uh, make it, uh, the, the cancer he had was too aggressive, however, he went into elections, he knew he was going to win, and he won. And then he picked uh, Nicolas Maduro, and they ran the elections again in 2013, and it was a very close election. A lot of people think that the uh, results were rigged, and I think there is, there is uh, enough evidence today to say that uh, that might have happened. Uh, and so, again, this business of, uh, of a candidate who is, in my opinion, not qualified to run the country, piggyback in a, on, a, on a Hugo Chavez uh, popularity. That's one of the things that, that happened. Uh, what has begun to happen after this is that they be, began to, oh, okay, then there, was, there were elections of National Assembly in 2015, the opposition won, you know, by a landslide, and then the government began another trick, which is, I, I don't recognize you, and I tried to create a parallel a body that would, uh, you know, kind of varnish the, the, the government as a democracy. And that's what they did. They call an election, uh, they call an election of a, a national constitutional assembly to reform the constitution, the propaganda machine of the government. And I, I'm not sure if you know, but about 95% of the media is controlled by government, they owned by the by the Venezuelan government, so they can pass on that message that the issue that they have is that they have an economic war with the US, which is the term they've used, very much like the uh, that the economic blockade of uh, Cuba, and, and they convinced everyone that that's a problem, and he called an election, and they won, because the opposition did not endorse that, that uh, constitutional, um, uh, constitutional assembly, because it, it's not in the Constitution. Simply, and they didn't follow the steps of the Constitution. So they begin, you know, they've been doing this, they're deviating from the Constitution every time a little bit, and then, in my opinion, it's become a complete derailment of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the situation. The last trick is that they delay, if you look, regional elections are held, supposedly to be held every four years. So here it is. But then, since they lost the, uh, the uh, National Assembly election, they delay the uh, regional elections to uh, to see if they found a better time to go, uh, that you know, better time for for uh, for the government to win the election. So this has been the trick that has been, uh, uh, and, and that's why I called uh, the the uh, raid. So um, oh, see, this is. I hope I hope this is not. I'm getting a message here. It doesn't show in there, but I'm getting a message here that unable to connect to the box. Oh, it went away. So, so the notion that the government is uh, is winning it doesn't match. It's not consistent with the popularity surveys or the surveys of acceptance of the president. So uh, I just gonna, I'm just going to show you the latest uh, poll. Uh, the, the negative uh, perception of the president is 72.3% and the positive perception is 24.1% and what uh, the most recent one has is 80% uh, negative perception. It is consistent across all the surveys, well except the ones from the government. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so
so you know it, it doesn't match. You know, we're winning the elections, but we are uh, we're not winning the. And then you know what you see when I cited the numbers of people crossing the border in Colombia and Brazil, and and the uh, refugees seeking for asylum. What, what it tells you is that people are walking without voting with a fit. You know, it, it's a uh, so, so um, they, they, they've done a good job of creating a, a parallel state institutions not part of the Venezuelan constitution. They, they created communal councils uh, to, to parallel uh, municipal councils in areas where they are controlled by the opposition. Uh, they created communes which are kind of uh, small, tiny corporations to run businesses in, in the communities. They've created para, paramilitary organizations, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, not like the uh, ROTC, but uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of similar um, military in the reserve. And uh, uh, it's really a joke, but, but uh, it is happening. They created militias. These are, these are civilians that uh, they, 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 they're paid by the government, they drive motorcycles, mostly, they look like gangs, and, and if you're not behaving, you know, if, if there's a group of opposition uh, raising hell in, in any part of Caracas, they come in and beat up everybody. Uh, and then the National Guard is there and they, they just turn their backs, you know. So it's happened. The, in, in states where the uh, Government wins an election, they create a regional development corporation, uh, and then they take the power from the from the state. And they most recently they created this uh, local supply and production committees. And in in the popular popular terms, it's called the trap bag because this is a bag of food that is distributed to people. And that's how they they've been able to. So you know, some people refer to that as hunger control. You know. Uh, most recently, what I mentioned, they created a parallel national assembly because they didn't win the, the, the assembly. So it, it, um, now, it, now it's become more apparent to, to everyone. So, uh, so this is a summary. <coughs> Towards total control, control of the military, control of the media, radio, TV, and newspapers, uh, moving towards control of social media, uh, and they're learning from China. Uh, control of means of production. Uh, Chavez and Maduro, they nationalize just about everything in the uh, heavy industries and uh, they control. Uh, control of food supply, control of health, medications, control of the vote. That's something that I think we're beginning to see more and more. Uh, and using mechanisms similar to Romania, Cuba, and Belarus. Yeah. So, it's not a... Uh, um, so, uh, just a little story here. Venezuela is a member of the Organization of, Organization of American States. And the Organization of American States has, has a, a chart which, which is called the Letter for Democracy, which are principles that countries who are members of, which are members of the Amer Organization of American States, abide to. And if they deviate from that, they're, they're called on that. So the Organization of American States, which includes all the states in Latin America, Canada, and the U.S., uh, they've been calling on Venezuela time and time again and trying to hold the government accountable. And you know what the government did at the last minute? They got out of the Organization of American States. They said, we're, we're not going to belong to, you know, we're not going to belong to a club that we have as a man. <laughs> So, um, and the problem with the Organization of American States is that there is a group of Caribbean islands which are represented in the Organization of American States that Venezuela has been able to control, control the boat, you know, by supplying oil to, to them. So the, the Lima group was created and they uh, got together in August 8th, 2017, and uh, they... Uh, they took, a, they took a position on the creation of a parallel uh, national assembly by government. They just said that's unacceptable, that's unconstitutional, 
and we do not recognize it. And that's that this group, I think, was a reaction to the ineffectiveness of the organization of American states. But you can see here that Argentina is in this group, Brazil is in this group, Canada is in this group, and the U.S. is not in this group, because that does away with the argument that uh, the U.S. has an economic war with Venezuela. So, so these, are, these are countries that, uh, and by the way, these are the largest economies in, uh, in Latin America. So they've, they've been active, they've been meeting, and I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what's happening, but, uh, but they're, they're all very clear that they're, they, they're picking a fight with, with the government. And, and in spite of that, I mean, I'm not sure if you, any of you have seen the reaction of Venezuela whenever, uh, for, for example, in the municipal elections last Sunday, uh, the government won because the, the, the opposition didn't go to the elections and the, the U.S. government issued the declaration. You know, this is another sign that you're moving towards a, a, a totalitarian government. And then the, the response of the vice president of Venezuela was, you're, you're talking rubbish. This is, you know, so they insult anybody that, uh, that makes uh, an argument. Uh, the other piece of this is that, uh, I don't know if you know this, the organization, the um, United Nations, they, sometimes when there are hot topics that the uh, Security Council does not want to deal with because one of the members veto, vetoes the topic, they have this kind of group, uh, and they call it the Formula Aria. Aria was uh, the Venezuelan ambassador to the U.S., and they've used it in, in situations like Bosnia, South Africa, the Ukraine. And so they had a meeting without those who oppose. In the case of Venezuela, China and, and Russia were not comfortable in the Security Council, so they got together. And the, the group, the discussion was led by Luisa Magro, who is the uh, General Secretary of uh, the Organization of American States, who's been a very proactive uh, uh, pro-democracy in Venezuela. And, and they discussed the matter, they issued a declaration, but then you know, it was not official. But at least the topic was on the on the agenda of the UN in a very informal way. So, um, so we, that takes me to my last what well, my my kind of last slide. What are the political scenarios? The first uh, scenario is status quo. The current situation prolongs, and uh, and then we have. Maduro deepens his authoritarian regime. What they've been doing is they've been taking uh, opposition leaders, prisoners, detained opposition leaders, and they take, each time they take more than they release. So they give the uh, perception that, uh, you know, we're handling this. <laughs> we're releasing people. But they take more. No elections, repression, imprisonment of opposition leaders, economic and social crisis deepens. Uh, international pressure on Maduro increased. So I, my second scenario is anything in between the, with the bottom scenario, which is opposition groups gain traction. Uh, by the way, the government has been has done a, a, an excellent job of fragmenting the opposition group, uh, fragmenting them to the point that uh, they've not been able to unify again. And uh, and you know they <laughs> and again when you have control of the uh, means of uh, infusion news, uh, you know, the means of the mass media, uh, you can really have an impact on individuals. Such an impact that even opposition leaders buy the information that is being. Uh, so the government is having negotiations with the, with the opposition in the Dominican Republic, and then the government will use that because they keep announcing that we have an agreement. It's only about five minutes. We, we got them in the back. And that, that type of announcement goes really back to opposition leaders that question the dialogue. So, so it, it's a very uh, tricky situation. Anyways, opposition groups gain traction against social unrest, repression, and violence. Uh, Maduro's paramilitary groups will come into action, and, and they've been in action. Potential democratic outcome with elections through negotiations. 
the Republic of the Dominican Republic election. Uh, it, it, we might go through a period of uh, governability crisis. Uh, international international pressure on Maduro yields, yields results, and then most political analysts that I've talked to uh, in Venezuela they say that uh, Maduro they only see Maduro being forced out of government in a kind of a Zimbabwe style, I, I put that in there. <laughs> because what happened to Mugabe is that he tried to appoint his wife as, uh, as president, and then the party said, or oh, the military, they said, no, no, no. To Mugabe, uh, you're out of business here, and, uh, and they took him out. Uh, so Maduro could make a mistake like that, like, anyways. Uh, but I, I, uh, I, I keep, tracking the, uh, everything I see about Venezuela. And this is a guy, uh, Pedro Mario Burelli, who uh, wrote a tweet this morning, in the morning today. And he says how he, Pedro Mario Burelli was a member of the board of directors of PDVSA. I mean, that's a high-ranking position in Venezuela. That's before Chavez. Of course, he was kicked out uh, once Chavez came into power. So he says, he says the following, this is a brutally realistic, uh, I'm, I'm being brutally realistic. I see two scenarios for Venezuela. We, we consolidate ourselves as a Somalia in the Caribbean with uh, no governability, misery, and the, uh, the exodus of uh, two to three million people more. And then the second scenario is uh, the uh, regime collapses due to you know, poor economics and, and then there's a, an international rescue. I uh, give 65% to the first scenario and 35% to the second, but I'm working for the second scenario. <laughs> so uh, so the, I, I read this from, from Lex Valenza. I, I hope you all remember Lex Valenza. He's a socialist. Uh, uh, was president of Poland, uh, really led a, a workers' revolution, so I don't think anybody could doubt about his socialist uh, background, uh, Nobel Prize winner, but he apparently said this, uh, and I have to say I have not been able to corroborate it, but it, this was in the news in Venezuela. He said Venezuela is being held hostage by a group of drug dealers and terrorists, uh, and that's the, I share that thought, by the way. So with that, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Chavez as uh, a uh, cohort, uh, but uh, but in any case, those army officers that saw Chavez as a leader are the ones that are uh, ruling the country. So the army is totally behind the government right now. Um, the um, and, and I think that it is because the army army officers are controlling all the state companies. You know, this that I mentioned before, cement, uh, steel, uh, uh, all the major industries that uh, were nationalized. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of motivation related to money uh, in there. The other thing that I think happened, I'm, I'm not sure because I was not there, but I think in the, it, since Chavez arrived in government, began a process of brainwashing 
the army. <coughs> so if you walked into the uh, military academy, you would see his his uh, portrait everywhere with the revolution. You know, um, let's, let's see. I forget what the word of the Cuban revolution was. Uh, you know, revolution, uh, and, or we die, something like that. Which, by the way, Chavez died, so they changed it to, to something else. <laughs> <laughs> Dying would not, is not an answer. But, but the, uh, to answer the question directly, the government controlled the army, the military, overall. And it's, it's a very, from what I understand, it's a very strict uh, situation where anybody dissenting with government within the military is taken out. Uh, so people are very, very careful. I, I have to tell you a personal story. My brother is retired as a general from the army, and I call him on a regular basis on the phone, and I ask him, you know, I ask, I call him about this talk and give me your perception. He says, "Can't talk to you on the phone." Whoa. That was my question. This <laughs> article a few months ago that was suggesting there was one particular general, I think the army chief, maybe. That was the de facto coming the de facto behind the scenes power with Maduro more or less as a front man. Right. Is that what you pretty much yeah. think is happening? I, I don't think there's a there's a not there's an army officer that leads the uh, the, you know, there's a particular leader. You could say the Ministry of Defense is, is, the, is the lead. The guy who now took over PDVSA is the lead officer. I, I think they have a team. Uh, I don't think there's any single individual. Well, just segue off your comment. Just segue off your comment about uh, Cuba. Is Cuba still involved in the Venezuelan uh, uh, training of the Venezuelan police and military? And is, is uh, Putin uh, involved in Venezuela at all, economically or otherwise? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, on the one hand, I think Cuba is involved. Uh, I mean, after the uh, attempted coup in 2002 to overthrow Chavez, he couldn't find uh, in Venezuela reliable uh, people that, that would be unconditional to his cause. So he, uh, he uh, went to Cuba for security, you know, for. Uh, and so we brought in uh, Cuban people, Cuban intelligence, uh, uh, and that's how it, it has been since then. Now, I cannot attest to that. I, I don't know, but the information I have is that Cubans are everywhere where there's a kind of a critical notch, like uh, for, for, for the revolution. Uh, now, the, the connection with Putin is mostly through the debt, so through the external debt. Uh, out of the 150 billion in external debt that Venezuela has, <coughs> about 50 million are, are money owed to, uh, to China and Russia. Uh, China has given signs recently of not of losing patience. Uh, and they, one of the Chinese companies sued the government for not, not paying the debt. And by the way, today the news announced that uh, the government settled that by paying. Uh, uh, and then uh, Russia has also been uh, uh, less so than the Chinese, but they, they've said that they, they will give Venezuela a chance. So the lifeline in terms of, finan in terms of finances is Russia and China, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how long it will last. Because uh, what it is, is that these people keep lying to everybody. So I, I think the Russians and the Chinese, they know, they know that. Okay. Um, is there anything that the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Uh, AID can do to, uh, so to gain international support for immediate um, relief of the uh, humanitarian aid into Venezuela? Well, the... Uh, the Venezuelan government has been has been denying humanitarian aid. They, they, they said, no, we don't need it, we don't want it, we're not going to allow it. That's, that's the words that have been used. We're not going to allow it. So it, it's very difficult to uh, to handle that one because, uh, and the, the perception from the government side, the Venezuelan government, is that any intervention is an intervention. And, and they, they're not going to allow it. Uh, and so, you know, the public hospitals are really, really bad shape. Uh, those who have money go to the private clinics and, or private hospitals. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
I, I think humanitarian, I, I have to say, I call friends, uh, and that's one of the questions that Lynn had for me and David, that if I could give information about any, uh, how, how can we help Venezuela in this? How can we uh, channel humanitarian aid? And I call my friends in Venezuela, and nobody could tell me how. Uh, yeah, and this is a sad situation again, because Venezuela has always been thriving on money, so uh, fundraising for humanitarian purposes is a challenge. What I have said is uh, use the uh, Red Cross. I mean, that's to me that the Red Cross is everywhere. It's probably the best uh, mechanism to, to contribute to, to Venezuela. We have a, a, a question here that uh, kind of uh, stirs the other side of the coin, if you will, in terms of Maduro. Why should people support an opposition to Maduro whose only goal is quote unquote regime change and and other, the other goal being to reestablish the elite control of the government that was taking place before Chavez. I mean, you know, that, that's an interesting question because I don't think uh, you'd be restoring the elite. Uh, I mean, I can tell you my personal story. I come from a very poor neighborhood of Caracas. I had not a chance. I went to vocational school and that was the end of it. I had an opportunity to uh, interview with the Venezuelan Institute of Scientific Research, and they offered me a summer job, then they offered me a job, and then one year after my job, they offered me a scholarship to go to college, and then after that, they offered me a, a scholarship to go to grad school. I had no friends in government, and this is a story of my brother, my other brother, and my other brother. They all found a way, and, and, and my friends in the neighborhood, by the way. So uh, I don't see, you know, there might be some elitism in Venezuela, but I don't see it. I didn't see it before Chavez. So I would, I would argue, I would argue that. That. Uh, uh, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I think you've got it. Is is the is the um, um, oh no, the, the opposition has a plan, obviously. Mm. I mean, they, they do have a plan. I mean, this was the. Uh, the, the thing is that we have a history here where uh, Venezuela, when the price of oil hit $8 a barrel in, uh, in 1988, uh, it was practically in a similar situation. The government had to restructure the debt, go to the International Monetary Fund, and then get the recipe of the International <coughs> Monetary Fund, which is open the economy, <coughs> drop the tariff barriers, uh, reform the judicial system, reform the educational system, uh, privatize uh, uh, industry, and, and, they, and, and they did. They privatized the phone company, they privatized the steel, in, the, steel the big steel industry. Uh, and what has happened is that uh, those in government now who oppose that shift then uh, managed to stall that, that change. I don't see it as a... Again, I don't see it as an elite change. I mean, if, if it was elite, I mean, 17 years of this regime now, all those who were elitists are somewhere else. Those who, I think those who are staying behind are really idealists. I just don't see that. And they do have a plan. Open up the economy. It's working in Argentina. Argentina just made that shift. Uh, it, it's working in Chile. It's working in Mexico. It's working in, in Colombia. It's working everywhere. So I, I just don't see how you could swim against the current here, uh, uh, honestly. Staying in the economic realm, um, it appears that on the surface that how, how can you have such high inflation if the price of oil is down? Doesn't that take less? Does that have less money in the con in the economy? Well, the uh, <coughs> well, that's a good question. That's a classic because what it is is that the central bank is printing money. Uh, that's a classic, uh, classic of high inflation uh, periods. Uh, so, so you might have less dollars, and that's why you have the exchange rate went from, I think, in the last uh, seven months or in, in this year went from about 500 bolivars to a dollar to 100,000 bolivars to a dollar. I mean, that's a. You, you look at the charts, whichever way you look at it, and then the government says because there is a website, very popular website, which is called Dollar Today, that quotes the dollar, the price of the dollar in the border of Venezuela and Colombia, in Cucuta. 
and they say that the problem is that dollar today is, and they say this, which is, dollar today is part of the economic war, and it is contributing to, to, uh, to the uh, devaluation of the Bolivar. And so they, they have sued dollar today, which is based in the U.S., and, and the judge has said, uh, this, this is uh, freedom of the press or freedom of speech. We, we cannot, we're not going to block this. But if you go to the website of Dollar Today, you will see the interference of uh, other things popping up trying to block the, uh, the website. So, uh, so it, 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 what it is is that, I mean, it, in my opinion, it's very simple. You have a government that has no credibility in terms of uh, in terms of uh, managing the economy. I show you the numbers. I show you that the central bank is not reporting the main economic indicators. They have no credibility. So the dollar is the price of the dollar in the in the in the, market, in the open market is uh, speculation. You may want to call it that way, but if you don't trust the system. And, and you have inventory that you need to replace, you know, you're indexing the price. That's why inflation is, is high. So, I mean, I think the, the, the economic situation is a classic. I, I mean, I, I just don't know how these people are managing it that way. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't, it seems like they don't know the history of economics in the world. Uh, this is a devil's advocate question here, I sure. think. Um, isn't it okay for the Maduro government to ban political parties from the uh, upcoming elections, given the fact that the opposition has uh, boycotted the most recent election, said they will boycott any election, and lastly, they were behind the uh, the violent protests earlier this year. So did, did, the, did the opposition make a mistake uh, and give the uh, Maduro government the, a basis for, uh, for banning them going forward? Well, you know, that's the basis for the division of the opposition. Because we, within the opposition, there are those who believe that we should give uh, uh, democracy a chance and vote, and those who believe that, you know, we shouldn't give in no opportunity to this government. So those, the, these other group would say, we shouldn't go to the elections. And, and this other group says, we should, we should go to the elections. And, and I think that's where the government has been masterful in dividing and creating those two Groups. I mean, there might be more uh, groups uh, in, uh, in 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 play here, but but the essence is that uh, the opposition is fragmented right now. Um, and I think again, the government has done a good job of uh, of making that happen. I'm, I'm not sure if I missed. Part no, of no, I think I think you got it. You know, um, I think maybe the last one here. You know. What can anything be done by any organization outside of Venezuela to uh, uh, help them deal with their hyperinflation and the economic uh, turmoil it's creating? You know, I I really don't know, uh, to be honest, because I, what I'm doing is trying to help people. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I just all the money that I put aside for to help Venezuela, I channel it to people I know people I know who are suffering, particularly people depending on a pension. Uh, you know, the pension is the, the last uh, thing indexed in an economy in bad shape, you know, the last uh, uh, amount of money that gets uh, raised to the real uh, value or to, the, to a reasonable purchasing value. So I've been, I've been trying to help that way, but I don't see a structure, I don't see a, a mechanism. And, and, and again, the government is blocking all the mechanisms. So in a sense, the uh, there's a lot of people being cornered here. Uh, and, uh, that's why, I mean, that one scenario is, uh, is a political explosion or implosion where, where uh, this happened in, in 89 when, when the first uh, package of economic reforms came into place. Uh, Caracas went into a three-day turmoil, uh, and that was what stalled the economic reforms back then. But when, when, when Chavez gave the coup d'etat to uh, Carlos Andres Paris, the economic growth was at 6%, unemployment was at 6%, the economy was in real good shape, and uh, it was really coming back on track. But, uh, you know, I, I think the, the questions of who, had, who is right on this, 
I, I don't think you, you're going to find the answer in Venezuela. I think you're going to find the answer in the economic and political models in the rest of the world. Where there's been democracy, where there's been open market opportunities, where it's, there's been competition, there's been economic growth. Where we get into a heavily regulated economy, we, we get into a, 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 a government dictating everything, controlling everything, like I, I showed my talk, then, then you don't go anywhere. And, and, and you know, the, the smarter people are, the quicker they run away from that type of situation. So, <laughs> that's uh, Paul, thank you very, very much. Great presentation. This is the place that we've been showing you. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Don't, this is my third plate, by the way. <laughs> You're going for a set of six as well. <laughs>